Ken Usada is your average high schooler with above average grades and dreams, just like any normal person. Ever since he's learned to read and write, he's been forced to live with his disability. In some cases, Ken would try too hard to be extraordinary and has been having a pretty hard time trying to be especially when it came to getting girls. Having tried so hard and failed miserably at being extraordinary, Ken gave up and developed some sort of envy for those who stand out easily. Amongst the people Ken hates are the two most popular students in the entire school, the student council president, Suzuni Inukami, and her vice president, or assistant, Kazuki Ryusen. One can't blame Ken though, as everyone in the school pretty much either adores the two, or just outright hates them for no apparent reason. Heck, even some of the students can swear on their lives that the duo is dating, and if one looks closely enough, it's clear that they aren't. It's a normal day just like any other, and the storm clouds gather for a heavy downpour. It was also closing time that hour, but some of the students had to pause whatever they were doing just to look at the majestic president and her vice president striding through the hallway with serious looks of confidence beaming down their faces. As they walk through the hallway, Suzun speaks to her VP about an argument they had to conduct concerning the students' welfare, and Kazuki, the vice president of the student council, assures her that he's got all the documents necessary to make up a good argument. Glad to have such a competent person handling her Suzune. Smiles as she and her VP walk into their office and out of sight. In another part of the school, Ken says goodbye to his buddies as they disperse to get to their homes. Once his friends are gone, Ken stares into nothingness and gets reminded of how worthless his life is at the moment. He keeps on walking forward till he finds a bird's nest up in the corner of a wall. After close inspection, he realizes just how hungry the birds are and decides to do the Lord's work by getting a ladder, reaching up to the birds, and feeding them some bird feed. When he's done, he heads back down and starts to wonder how different his life would be if he suddenly had powers and became extraordinary, knowing fully well that that was impossible. Ken quickly deads the thought and rushes back inside the school as the rain is already falling. Inside, Ken stares at the only umbrella left on the umbrella stand and considers stealing. However, his inner angelic Ken warned him not to do such a thing. As such, Ken decides to sit down and wait till the rain stops before he gets back home. After waiting for a whole 30 minutes and thinking about how cool things would be if he had magic, the rain keeps falling and he gets annoyed. While throwing a temper tantrum, Suzune shows up and talks to him for the first time in his life. Ken stutters as he's at a loss for words, but then Suzune asks him why he's still at school and even offers him an umbrella. As expected, Ken, who couldn't even construct a sentence, tells her not to worry about him and that he'll try to get home as quickly as possible, even if it means him getting drenched in the rain. Suzuni, however, stops him from getting home in the rain and is about to offer him to walk home with her when Kazuki, her VP, shows up and calls Ken by his first name after offering him one of their spare umbrellas. Surprised, Ken thanks Kazuki and accepts their offer to walk home with them. Together, the three of them wait out the rain a little while chatting and teasing each other. Eventually, when the rain dies down a little, they all hit the road. On their way home, Ken asks Kazuki why he hides that side of him from the other students, especially the boys. Kazuki tells him it's because the girls talk to him too much, and this may have been pissing off the boys way more than he'd expected. Satisfied with his reply, Ken moves on to ask Suzuni about herself. He lets her know that he envisions her as this strong woman who's got everything figured out. Sadly, Suzuni crushes any hopes of him feeling himself and tells him she's just an ordinary third-year high school girl. Kazuki and Ken get a little serious and urge Suzuni to think more highly of herself. At this point, Ken outrightly asks them if they're dating, and the two pause for a while to respond to him. Unlike the rumors tell the story, Suzun and Kazuki weren't dating, and they told Ken about it. Ken stops with the questions and continues watching the two prodigies frolic around each other in front of him. Seconds later, Suzune gets curious and asks both Ken and Kazuki what they thought about doing after school. Kazuki tells her he hasn't got it figured out yet, but then he gets curious and asks Suzune why she asked them such a question. Suzune tells him that she's been too competent and bored of her gift, as she usually completes all her goals in such a short period. She even mentions that sometimes she doesn't feel like she is where she's meant to be and is itching for a miracle to happen. Little did she know that the impossible was about to happen. It all began when an electric spark in the air caused the wires on the power lines up above them to almost snap and kill them. Just then, Kazuki and Suzune begin to hear faint sounds of bells clanging against one another. They ask Ken if he could hear anything, but Ken tells them he couldn't hear a thing. Suddenly, Ken walks close to the two of them, and a bright yellow magic circle appears underneath them. Leaving them with no chance of escape, the circle instantly teleports Ken, Kazuki, and Suzune to another world, and they wake up to find themselves in another world. Kazuki wakes Ken up, and when he does, he struggles to come to terms with what is happening. He finds Kazuki looking pretty worried and realizes he was right. They've been summoned to another world. Even worse, they are currently in the palace of a king, 
in that world. When he turns to check on Suzune, he finds her fidgeting happily over the thought of her being teleported to another world. The King of the Linger Kingdom, King Lloyd Vulgast Linger, introduces himself with a heavy heart and explains himself and the reason for summoning the three of them to their world. According to his story, these three were being summoned to be heroes for their world as they were under attack from the Demon Lord they tried to push away a few years ago. Now that the Demon Lord is back and better, with more power under his chain of command, this magic spell, the hero summoning, was their last resort as they never had any other choice but to do it. The king beseeches all three of them to assist him and help him bring down the nefarious Demon Lord. After hearing everything the king just said, Kazuki stops him there and curses him for bringing them to his world without their consent or volition. They too have families they'd all like to take care of and he demands that they're taken back to their world that instant. With a sorrowful look on his face, Lloyd tells him there's no way to send them back to their world as the hero summoning spell is one-sided. With this, Kazuki gets seriously pissed and decides to punch the king. However, his guard stepped in, and Ken begged him to calm down so he did. Knowing that he's messed up pretty badly, the king gets off his throne and kneels before the impending heroes to beg them for their help. Before accepting his offers, Suzuni finally speaks up and asks them how they know they're heroes in the first place, despite not knowing anything about them. Just then, the king's mage assistant, Welsi, gets up and explains to them that the sound of the bell that they heard before they were summoned was what qualified them to be heroes in the first place. One thing rang in their mind, and they remembered that Ken complained about not hearing the sound initially. Does this mean that Ken is just tagging along? Well, to find that out, Ms. Welsi takes three of them to the library to discover their magic affinities. To do this, however, they will each have to place their hands on a crystal ball and let it glow. Whichever color the ball glows to indicates their magic affinity. Suzuni goes first and figures out that her affinity is thunder after the ball gives a yellowish hue. While Suzuni checks out her powers, Kazuki tries to get a reaction out of Ken as he asks him about his feelings after finding out he might be useless. Ken tells him there's nothing he can do about that now, so he can only try to be positive and let fate carry him wherever he needs to go. Kazuki, who seems pretty impressed with Ken's reasoning, commends his thought process process and walks up to the crystal ball to find out his magic ability. His power puts off a whitish hue on the crystal indicating that he has a strong affinity for light magic. Kazuki seems pretty disappointed about this but then Suzuni gets feisty and teases Kazuki for his affinity. Ken tries to talk her out of it but Suzuni faces him and puts him in his place. Welsi tells Kazuki not to be too disappointed in his powers as he has the power to dispel evil. Kazuki walks back to his spot and waits for Ken to do his thing. Upon placing his hand on the crystal, a bright green hue ensues and Ken gets a teensy bit disappointed as well. After making a few comments about his magic affinity, Kazuki and Suzune turn to Welsi, only to find her completely shell-shocked to see such a rare color come to light. Without saying a word, Welsi takes Ken to the king and explains the hue of the crystal ball to him. On hearing that Ken's color is green, the pretty cheerful king gets seriously worried for Ken's safety as, at the time, Ken's power was extremely rare and hard to find. To protect him from the only other person who has such power, Lloyd considered taking him somewhere far from the kingdom. Before he ends his meeting, the second wielder of Ken's magic, Rose with the green hairstyle and astute sense of presence who's also the captain of the rescue team, barges into the king's quarters unannounced and asks for the results of the hero summoning. The king gets extremely scared of Rose as she asks him about the results of the affinity checks. After walking a few steps into the room, she faces Ken and asks the king to tell her who he is. Scared, Lloyd tells her he's just a normal person who got lost and mingled during the hero summoning. Thankfully, Rose believes him and asks for Ken's name. After the necessary introductions, Welsi decides to take Rose to the crystal ballroom so she can check out the other heroes. Rose follows and walks out of the room ever so slowly. Before she could get out of hearing range, Dumb Ken spits out the color of his crystal ball and tells Rose that it is green. Rose turns back and asks his majesty to let her borrow the boy. Welsi quickly conjures a water shell spell that takes Ken pretty high up into the sky. However, Rose followed the water shell and broke Ken out of it after knocking him out. Upon doing that, she thanks the king for his service and hauls Ken back to her hideout. In the meantime, Welsi gets back to the other two to calm their minds about their friend. She explains the mystery behind the green color and tells them only rare mages, who are thought to have healing powers, have such a hue. As they speak, Rose is taking Ken to her hideout to train him using her unorthodox training style, and there is nothing they can do about it. By nightfall, Rose sits with Ken and introduces him to both her hideout, which is his new home, and her boys, all five of them. The boys, who seem to be high on some Zaza, pin Ken to the wall and introduce themselves to him. Rose kicks the boys off Ken and warns them not to scare the living out of poor Ken. After reprimanding them, 
she introduces them as her housemates, who are not mages, and tells Ken that she plans on drumming the tricks of learning healing magic into Ken. To make matters worse, she lets him know that his training begins the next day. That night, Ken gets very restive as he is unable to sleep. Eventually, he gets too tired to stay up and falls asleep. In the meantime, Rose was eager to see what Ken would turn out to be like in due time. She stands by her window and wonders what comes next. The next morning, Ken wakes up after having a nightmare about getting teleported to another, only to find out that it's actually true, and he's currently living his life in another world. He checks around the room to see whether it matches the one in his dream, and unfortunately, it does. One of Rose's men, who was making breakfast for all of them, opens the door to check in on Ken. Once he finds out he's awake, he greets him and tells him about the guests coming over to greet him. Ken gets up from his bed and freshens up so his friends can find him in good shape. In a few moments, both Suzune and Kazuki arrive at Rose's home to see their friend, Ken. During their meeting, Ken stops at nothing to narrate the horrible things he passed through with Rose when she found out he had healing magic. To make matters worse, Ken remembers that he's supposed to pass through some hellish training with Rose for the next couple of weeks, and gets even sadder. Suzuni and Kazuki feel for their friend as they can see how worried he looks concerning his impending training with Rose. Suzuni asks if he truly wants to go through with the training and Ken tells her he has to so he can get stronger and protect them all on the battlefield. Suzune gets fired and commends Ken for being brave and courageous. She also tells him about their training regimen and informs him they'll be starting their swordsmanship training that same day as well. Ken takes a look at their uniforms and compliments them. Kazuki, after hearing so many inspiring words from his friend, Ken, gives him a pat on the back and thanks him for inspiring everyone to keep trying harder. Following that gesture, both Kazuki and Suzuni return to their entourage and take their leave. Ken watches as his friends walk away from him and hopes their training meets them well. He gets a little worried about their well-being but eventually learns to put his trust in them and let them do what they want. A few seconds after his friends leave, Rose opens the door behind Ken to say hi and remind him about training. Ken, upon seeing her, freezes in his stance and apologizes for seeing his friends behind her back. With a straight face, Rose tells Ken not to worry about that, as he's always going to be free to see whoever he wants to see. She then hands him a brand new journal and encourages him to input his daily training regimen and his thoughts about it into the journal, as this would help his overall training as a whole and help him adjust to any issues he finds during training. Once she's sure Ken got the message, she tells him to get ready to begin the training after breakfast. Then, she gets back into the house to have some breakfast. Ken gulps his saliva and realizes that the infamous training from hell is about to start in a few hours. A few hours after breakfast, Ken finally begins the training. Before his training regimen begins, Tong and the other servants of Rose have told him about the hell he's going to face when it finally starts. However, Ken was pretty optimistic about things as things didn't seem to be very bad from the beginning. Sadly, he soon finds out how wrong he was to think that. To begin his training, Rose introduces him to the concept of mana and tells him his training would focus solely on how to manifest the mana into healing magic and use it to help his comrades on the battlefield. After making sure he understands what mana is, Rose takes him inside and shows him a particular book containing information about important places and locations of the Demon King army and Linger Kingdom. Ken finds out why Linger had always been the first kingdom the Demon King attacked, seeing as it's their neighbor. Rose also explains the other things Ken can expect to find in the book, which can be races, and demons. Ken spends the whole of day one reading the book from page to page. On day two, Ken ran like a M fair on steroids. By day three, he continued running till his muscles got sore and his legs gave out. Rose came by and slapped some life into his legs with her healing magic. Ken throws a tantrum for a few seconds and then gets a little surprised when he finds out his legs have been healed. He continues running till the end of the day. On day four, he starts training with the other members of Rose's team. They make fun of how slow and tardy Ken was while running with them, but Ken tried to keep up with them. Rose notices him lagging and makes snide remarks about his running. Ken, who is already getting tired of her calling him names, almost swears at her, but then decides to control himself and avoid getting smacked in the head. By day six, Ken ran in the rain and tripped over after getting insulted by Rose at one point. He gets back up and suddenly notices the green glow of healing energy on his hands. This makes him realize that he may be learning to manifest healing magic at will now. On the next day, which is day 7, Ken gets his butt kicked by Rose after slowing down again. To make matters worse, Rose raises the difficulty of the test and tosses him high up in the air for no reason. By day 9, Ken learns to use his healing magic to heal up his butt cheeks as he keeps on getting his ass whooped by Rose. Little by little, he learns the importance of using healing magic to heal up his entire body. Soon, he slowly started incorporating healing magic into his entire body and would sometimes keep the magic slowly flowing into his body to keep him on his feet. Suddenly, life became much easier for him 
as he now found a way to quickly heal his muscles once they got too sore to move. One thing did bother Ken though, and that's the fact that he's been running ever since they started training. He began to question the regimen he was now getting used to, and wished there was some sort of twist to it. He can't surely spend all his training time running and think he's fulfilled now, can he? Anyway, Ken keeps his mouth shut and decides to trust his master, Rose, to do the right thing. On day 10, Ken runs 30 more laps than before, and nearly dies during this training regimen. By day 11, Rose adds push-ups to Ken's training regimen. After doing 819 push-ups at once, he begins to use healing magic to heal his body. While he continues his push-ups, Rose finally tells him the reason why his training regimen is like that. She was training his muscles to be very strong so that he could run as fast as possible on the battlefield and save more people in a limited time. Ken thinks about her words and continues doing his push-ups. By day 12, he ran till afternoon and then finished his training for the day with push-ups. Life became a little easier for Ken as he noticed his body getting lighter and lighter with each passing day. By day 13, Rose makes things hard again by making Ken run with weights on his body. He was able to scale through that day unfazed, but by the next day, someone does the unthinkable to Ken's lunch. Ken had just taken his break that day, only to find out that his lunch had been eaten by one of Rose's dudes. Even worse, the dude gloats about eating Ken's lunch, which pisses him even further. Annoyed, Ken trashes the entire dining hall and chases the dudes all through the fields to catch him and beat the shit out of him. About a week later, Kazuki and Suzune, escorted by the Princess of Linger Kingdom, Celia, and the head of the kingdom's knights, came by again for another visit. Upon getting to Rose's land, they find her sitting on a concrete slab she placed on Ken's back. From the looks of things, Rose had his push-up regimen upgraded and was even about to make things much harder for poor Ken, Usado. She gets down from the first concrete slab and slams another one on his back. Kazuki and Suzune look at their friend in shock as they realize just how strong Ken has gotten in such a short period. Suzune takes a look at Ken's insane muscles and drools over how well-defined they are. Siglis gets pissed at the inhumane training regimen Rose was making her student pass through. Rose, however, tells Siglis not to worry about someone like Ken as he needs to be able to handle this level of training if he's going to be her right-hand man shortly. Ken, who never knew Rose had such intentions, is shocked upon hearing the news from his master's mouth. Moving on, Rose mentions some of the amazing manly qualities she's found in Ken's body and tells him to take a food break with his friends and the princess. As they walk to another part of the forest, Siglis scolds Rose and hopes to get her head back in the right place. Meanwhile, Ken and his people settle down under a tree to eat their lunch. Ken gets a little confused and asks them who the young lady with them is. Celia apologizes for her rudeness and introduces herself formally as the Princess of the Linger Kingdom. On hearing this, Ken gets very sorry for not paying his respects from the beginning and even goes down to kneel and beg her for mercy. However, Princess Celia chuckles and tells Ken not to worry too much about the formalities. Instead, she advises him to focus on the finely woven bread cake she baked specially for their picnic. The three friends cut into the bread cake and enjoyed some of the slices. Over food, Ken asks his buddies about their training regimen with Sir Siglis. Kuzaki tells him about their training regimen and also tells them how humane the training is compared to the one he passes through with Rose. Kazuki apologizes to his friend for having to go through such a tough regimen while they have things easy but then again, Ken tells him not to apologize for something he seems to enjoy. Suzuni, who was staring at Ken the entire time, opens his shirt without permission and exposes his six-pack. On seeing them, Suzuni gets very impressed. Ken tells his friends about his fun training regimen and even shows them a snippet of his power, assuring them that he's going to be there for them when the time gets tough. Suzuni tries to act like a normal girl, only to end up acting weird and making her peers laugh at her. Minutes later, the dude who ate Ken's food a few days earlier shows up with a peace offering. Ken takes one last look at the dude who brought him the peace offering and rejects his peace offering. Ken gets up with a sore look on his face and charges at the dude with murderous intent. Together, the two have a go at it and punch each other till they get tired. Kazuki and Suzuni get a little happy to see their friend doing very well. Judging by the looks of things, Ken seems to have surpassed them and this gave them the necessary confidence boost they needed to train harder. By nightfall, Ken checks out his body and realizes that Suzune is right about everything. His body and strength had improved much more than he imagined, but then there was one little problem with Ken, and he thought about it once more that night. Does he really have the mental fortitude to match the type of body he's building? Ken leaves the question unanswered and heads to bed for the night. The next day, Rose finally takes Ken on the infamous trip she usually takes her trainees on to show them the brutality of the outside world, and also to complete their training to make them fine soldiers. Rose heads out to meet one of the gatekeepers, Thomas, and cajoles him into opening the gates for her. Once that happens, Rose takes Ken on a long trip to the forest, popularly known as the Darkness of Linger. Now, 
To pass his final test, Ken is to head into the forest and capture a grand grizzly. If he can't get that done, then he fails his test. Ken stands and complains a little about his inability to fight, but Rose isn't one to condone excuses, so she picks him up and hauls his arse up in the air and into the forest. Ken stares at his life coming to an end as he free falls to the middle of the Linger Forest at incredible speeds. At one point during his descent, he imagines having his name in the news reported to have been killed by Rose, but then again, he knows he would be the worst coward if he allowed himself to die this way. So, Ken decides to survive all the way through and finish the mission in due time. To do this, he encloses his entire body in a healing aura, and initially hits branches on his way down. When he's close to the ground, Ken assumes a downward dog position and raises his muscular fists to punch the ground he's to land on. Ken's landing tactics work just fine, and this helps him make a safe landing without incurring any serious injuries. Now that he's there in the forest, it's now or never. Ken gives the Grand Grizzlies one more thought and shivers at the thought of having to hunt one of them. Just when he thought he was in the clear, a white Grand Grizzly appears behind him and threatens to end him right there. Ken feels his life flash before his eyes as his body freezes in time, unclear of what to do at the moment. Eventually, he muscles up and runs as fast as he can for dear life, completely scared of the humongous bear chasing after him. The bear also keeps up with Ken's speed, and even matches it at some point. Ken notices this and amps up his speed by healing his tired muscles over and over again. Even after doing such a thing, the bear still caught up to him, threatening to put him down. At this point, Ken knows shit is about to hit the fan, so he forces his mind to think of an easy way out of this problem so both he and his mind can be saved. Besides, compared to the hellish training regimen he survived from Rose, this bear is nothing. Ken thinks on his feet and figures out a good plan to keep the bears hidden. He takes the bear to the edge of a cliff just so he can isolate the bear and take it down when he's cornered it. Sadly for Ken, Papa Bear had backup, and before he knew it, two blue Grand Grizzlies joined Papa Bear to chase after their muscle-bound prey. Ken quickly forgets the tacky plan he had previously, and runs as fast as he can to the middle of nowhere. Luckily for him, he finds a waterfall just in front of him, and doesn't hesitate to jump into the waterfall. Thankfully, the beers get a little scared of the height so they stop at the edge and return to their normal daily activities. Well, there goes their lunch. After diving heads deep into the waterfall, Ken manages to find his way to the riverbank. He gets up and starts drying his clothes for the night. Then, he unpacks his bag to check for his supplies and finds only some emergency rations, a canteen, and a knife with nothing to start a fire with. Ken takes a shelled nut from the emergency rations and bites as hard as he can to get to the soft, fleshy insides. Bon appetit, Ken-san. After eating dinner, Ken hears a very loud roar from the distance. Still, he ignores the growl and gets some rest for the next day. Before sleeping, he finds a tree near him and uses his knife to make a sign on it to mark his first day in the jungle. The following morning, Ken wakes up and begins his daily job, which is hunting the grizzlies. He decides to learn a thing or two about his target before getting too close to them. To do this, he spends his day marking territories and investigating popular spots for grizzlies. At one point, he finds scratch marks on a particular tree trunk and gets on high alert, thinking a grizzly is nearby. He hears a few rustles in the shrubs near him and takes out his knife to fight whatever comes from the trees. To his surprise, a small black rabbit pops its head out of the shrubs to check on the person beyond the shrub. Ken Usado takes a closer look at the rabbit and finds out it's a little hurt on its right hind limb. Ken gets closer to the rabbit and uses his healing magic to take the wound away. Once he's done, he pets the rabbit and gets back to his daily job. After running around for a few seconds, he turns back and finds the rabbit following him. He tries to chase the rabbit away but eventually only ends up forcing it to follow him. Eventually, Ken gets used to the rabbit, and in due time, he asks the rabbit to show him where the Grand Grizzlies live. The rabbit, who surprisingly heard what Kin had to say, turns back and takes Kin to the Grand Grizzly spot. There, Kin finds the Grizzlies sleeping peacefully in their dens. Kin stays there for as long as he can, and studies all there is to study about the Grand Grizzlies before calling it a day. From what he could notice, Grand Grizzlies live in groups, but then again, Ken couldn't understand why this particular bunch chose to stick together like a family. Unfortunately, Ken wasn't able to get his answer. He returns to a river near him and refills his water bottle for the night, despite having doubts about the river's cleanliness. Sure, the water seems clean, but Ken suspects that it may be contaminated by germs. The rabbit continues following him everywhere he goes, and this kind of tickles Ken a little bit, who continues his research for the rest of the day. Ken takes a break at one point and drinks the river water. Minutes later, his stomach is nearly overrun by a terrible stomachache. He tries using healing magic to heal it right away, but unfortunately for him, that didn't help him out at all. 
the rabbit understands his plight and decides to help him the next time he's up. After getting his stomach back to normal, the rabbit takes Ken to a very secluded lake in the forest. There, Ken finds good drinking water and takes a sip of it. He turns to thank the rabbit for helping him out with his water problem, but then he finds the rabbit looking in another direction. He tries calling the rabbit to tell him what is going on, but then the rabbit seems too focused on what is bothering it. The rabbit ignores Ken and gets on a tree before urging Ken to get there with him. Ken gets up the tree and finds nothing in front of it. He then turns once again to check the rabbit out and finds it shivering as if it knew what was coming. Ken looks again in front of him, and just then, he finds the horrible giant serpent crawling the forest floor. Now this serpent has been known to plague the forest animals for years on end, and even the rabbit, who wasn't scared of the Grand Grizzlies, was severely scared of this one. Ken struggled to understand what was going on in front of him, as he'd never once read anything about such a serpent before. If there's one thing he could point out though, it's that the serpent's bloodlust could send chills down Hercules' spine. Ken forbids himself from getting too close to the serpent and waits patiently till the serpent moves past him. On day four, Ken continues his research on the Grand Grizzlies. Initially, he finds them cute, but then again, he knows he has to confront and defeat one of them if he's to pass Rose's challenge. Ken keeps his knife in his pocket and waits for the next day before challenging the big white Grand Grizzly. The next day, there's a heavy downpour and Ken gets up and ready to enter the heavy rain to start his thing for the day. But then the rabbit holds his legs and stops him from stepping into the rain to get his thing. When the rain stops, Ken gets back on the road and heads towards the Grand Grizzly's den to do the deed and pass the challenge. On getting there, he finds the bears, both Papa Bear and the others, all battered up and killed like roadkill. Ken smiles at his misfortune and wonders what Rose will say when she finds out what happened. He does a little more digging and realizes that the big snake must have killed them. This time, it didn't kill them because of food and only did it for sport. Just then, one of the bear babies showed up out of the rock where it was hiding and walked over to its dead mom to check up on her. Ken witnesses the poor baby bear groan over its dead family and promises to avenge the bear's deaths by killing the snake. He gets so engrossed by the rage in him that he gets into attack mode and keeps moving into the forest to search for the snake. In the meantime, Kazuki and Suzuni visit Rose's house to check up on their friend. However, they get shocked to the bone when they find out that Ken has been away from the house for 10 days straight. Kazuki gets a little worried and heads towards the forest to find him. On his way there, Suzuni tells him not to worry too much about Ken as he's a big boy and can handle himself. Besides, this is a test given to him by Rose, so there shouldn't be much to fear. Kazuki calms himself after hearing Suzun's words and decides to put his faith in Ken's power. Ken, on the other hand, eats and gulps down as much food as he can to prepare his body for the impending fight against the serpent. After sharpening a wooden stake, Ken asks the rabbit to take him to the serpent's location. The rabbit sniffs around a little bit and takes Ken to the place of the serpent. Ken finds the cub from the previous day biting down on the serpent's body and joins it to attack the serpent. After a few dodges and the likes, Ken manages to hit the serpent in the eye. The serpent reacts to the pain and pushes Ken backward. Ken takes an L for the most part and moves in for another strike. This time, the serpent clenches its fangs on Ken's left hand and stays put for the most part. Ken, who also had his knife on that hand, sticks it into the roof of the serpent's mouth until it lets go of his hand. Ken felt the effect of the snake's venom for a while, but then he quickly healed it up with his healing magic. Then, he strengthens his muscles for a final attack and ends up bashing the serpent in the head till it stops moving. Ken catches his breath after an overwhelming victory and smiles when the cub comes over to thank him for avenging his family. He promises to heal him back up immediately after he gets all the snake venom out of his hands. Just when he thought nothing could get worse, the serpent gets back up for a final round to end Ken once and for all. Unable to stand up, Ken waits for his death and blames Rose for sending him on such a dangerous mission. Mere moments before he gets his head chopped off by the serpent, Rose shows up and smashes the serpent's head with her incredible strength. Once she's done with the snake, she stomps her feet on the snake and makes sure to end for real this time. Shocked, Ken asks her how she was able to find him in time. It is then that Rose exposes the rabbit as Kukuru, her pet, whom she sent to watch over him throughout the test. She tells Ken that the injury on Kukuru's right hind limb was just an act to get in his favor. Then, she mentions that she was always around the corner to step in in case something happened to him, so there was nothing for him to worry about. Although she had planned to intervene as little as possible, there was no telling what could happen. Ken asks her about the serpent, and she tells him it's a serpent created by the Demon Lord's army. Siglis couldn't finish it in the previous invasion and it escaped to the forest to continue its life. She then moves on to explain that the serpent was so strong that even eight men would have a hard time fighting it. Ken cusses at her for putting him in such great danger, but then again, 
Rose said she wanted him to experience fighting something much stronger than him. So far, he was pretty interesting to watch. The bear cub beside Ken growls at Rose for putting his friend's life in danger. Ken, however, got up and petted the bear till it calmed down. The bear hugs Ken and takes a true liking to him. Rose takes the grizzly along with them so he can train to be Ken's pet attack animal and get stronger together. Rose hauls them all up with one hand and reminds Ken about the terrible things he said to her at his point of death. She threatens to take his sleep away for the night and then passes him. That evening, Rose finally promotes Ken to be her sidekick and urges him to get ready to follow her to the next battlefield as she has the feeling that the Demon King will be attacking Linger Kingdom soon. Around that time, the Demon King hails his supreme commander, Amila, and tells her to hasten the invasion plan against Linger Kingdom. Ken, after finding out about the impending war, asks Rose to clarify things a little. Rose tells him about his job on the battlefield, letting him know that he will be working with her on the front lines to heal the wounded on the spot so they can keep fighting till the battle is over. She also tells him they'd be part of the vanguard and would be working tirelessly to carry enemies from the front lines to the healing stations in the rear to keep them alive. Upon hearing this, Ken gets a little more curious than before and asks Rose about what happens to Tong and the others. Rose tells him there are others, but then again, Ken seems to be the best man for the job at the moment. Ken tells her he feels he's not there yet and still needs more training. However, Rose tells him it's fine to feel that way. But then again, he should buckle up in the little time they have left before the Demon Lord's army invades Linger. Meanwhile, the Demon King instructs his third commander, Amila, on the next course of action to take in this war so they don't repeat past mistakes and let Linger win. To end his meeting, he reminds Amila about her seriousness and asks her to smile a little bit more. With that, he dismisses her and lets her out of his room. Just outside the Demon Lord's room, Hiraluk, the demon doctor and innovator for the Demon King, shows up to tease Amila over how worried she looked after she met with the Demon Lord. Amila tells him to mind his business and quit putting his mouth where it's not wanted. Then, she walks in the opposite direction to continue doing her thing. Hyraluk stops her from leaving his side and invites her to come to check out his latest monster design for the war against the Linger Kingdom. Seeing as she had nothing to do, Amila decided to follow Hyraluk to check out his latest prototype. On getting to his workshop, she finds the new prototype to be an upgrade from the previous demon snake that Ken killed in the forest back then. Amila is not impressed one bit by the similarities, and Hyraluk sees this. To pacify her heart, he tells the commander that the snake is a highly venomous snake that has a large body with sharp fangs. After that, he named the project Demon Maid Monster Prototype 72 Baljanak. Amila reminds him of what happened to the previous version of the demon snake and tells him she senses the same fate happening to this demon snake later in the future. Hiraluk is thrown into a rave of complaints, as he tries to prove to her that this snake is much better than the last one. He even tells her the soldier who took down the previous one and calls his name Siglis. Amila, however, recounts the real headaches of the Linger army, and that's the rescue team most especially their leader Rose, who mandates her workers to run around the battlefield and pick up wounded soldiers before carrying them to the rear part of the battlefield to heal them up. This way, they can minimize their casualties by a bunch. Amila also confesses that Rose is a top-notch fighter as well, and this makes her very annoying to deal with. Plus, Rose seems to hold a very deep grudge over their master, and she wants to do something about it. Sadly, there was very little Amila could do about it as she is forbidden to fight at the frontlands now that she's a commander. Not to worry though as she has someone that can help her kill Rose on the battlefield. She calls the person the immortal mage of darkness, the Black Knight. Very early the next morning, Ken wakes up a happy man who just slept on a bed after a full month of training and sleeping on the hard rocks. He gets up from his bed and goes to the backyard to treat his blue grizzly bear, whom he called Blurin to a nice fruity meal. The duo eat the meal together and bond over munching down the delicious fruit. Soon, the black bunny from earlier shows up and charms Ken into giving it some of the fruit to eat. Rose shows up a while later and catches Ken calling the bear Blurin. She checks to confirm if that's truly the name Ken wishes to give it, and he tells her yes. She tells Ken that she's already reported the bear to the king who granted her permission to keep the bear. However, if the bear is to become an integral member of the rescue team, then it will have to earn its keep and do something outstanding. Rose then gives the bear a menacing stare that makes it cower in fear just from her audacious gaze. Ken gets the feeling that Rose wants Blurin to make himself useful that instant, so he asks her what she wants, the blue grizzly bear to do. Rose immediately finds a tedious simulation training regimen for both Ken and his precious bear. In a few minutes, Rose has Ken put on some weights and also carry Blurin to begin the simulation training. Once that's done, she explains the point of the training to him, which is to mimic the reality of the battlefield. 
Ken is to imagine Blurin as a wounded soldier he's to save before he dies. To complete the training, Ken has to run several miles to get to the rear end of the battlefront so Blurin can make it in time. Ken begins his training in earnest and runs slowly at first just to conserve mana. However, Rose shouts at him to keep up the pace so Blurin doesn't lose his life due to his sluggishness. After only running a few meters forward, Rose's goons begin to pop out of shrubs near the path to attack Ken as the enemy would on a real battlefield. Although Ken is surprised by this, he still manages to avoid getting hurt. Eventually, he escapes all the surprise sneak attacks and survives the first hour of the challenge. Just when he thought he was out of the woods, another one of Rose's goons appears from underground and swings his wooden swords at him. Ken dodges the sword and meets the skank master up front. He maneuvers his way around and continues moving on to the final lap of the run. After running for four hours straight without stopping, Ken's body finally gives out and he faints from exhaustion. Shortly afterward, Rose shows up and lectures him on the reason why he got exhausted so easily. Judging from the training she's given him, Ken is supposed to endure at least six hours of continuous running while piggybacking someone or something. When she's done, she places her hands on his forehead and heals him while telling him to acquire the necessary mental fortitude and decisiveness to keep himself running throughout the battlefield. After healing him, she gives him a short break and instructs him to continue running around the castle town with Blurin after his mana's fully recovered. Ken spends the next hour gathering his mana, and when he gets it all back, he continues running through town with Blurin on his back. Initially, the villagers are a little scared of the weird dude running through town with a bear on his back. But then again, they notice the uniform Ken had on and realize that he's from Rose, the crazy healing medic. Ken keeps on running till he finds a stall selling the fruit he and his bear were eating earlier that morning. The stall owner calls the fruits peffles and mentions that they're a specialty of the kingdom. Moving on, Ken asks the woman to tell him why the villagers aren't bothered about him running through the town with the bear. The woman tells him it's because of the uniform he has on. Confused, Ken asks for more clarification and the woman tells him that the villagers are already used to seeing crazy, scary men running around town in such a uniform so they've learned not to think too much about it. Ken suddenly gets it, and thanks her for speaking with him. As for the fruit, he didn't have any money to buy the fruit so he told her he'd come back next time. The lady offers him the fruit for free, and Ken collects it in good faith before feeding it to his bear. Soon, he leaves, and a lady with cat ears called Amako shows up from the building behind the stall to ask the lady about the rescue team member she just saw. Nothing much comes out of their conversation so everything goes back to normal. Ken continues moving towards the castle grounds and considers meeting his peers Kazuki and Suzuni. On his way, however, a blonde dude sees him and runs after him while calling his name till he faints. Ken looks back and finds the poor man lying flat on the floor. He picks him up, heals him, and introduces himself properly as Ken from Rose. The blonde guy also introduces himself as Orga Fleur, one of the other two people Rose was talking about. Ken quickly gets acquainted with Orga and finds out just how impressive he is. Orga praises him for undergoing and passing the captain's heavy training and lets him know that he's one of the healers staying in the rear part of the battlefield. Plus, he's a weaker healer than Ken and can't heal himself once he's wounded. He also tells Ken about his sister, who supports him with the healing process as well, and tells him they all try to work together so they can heal as many as they possibly can. Ken tells him that the captain told him to join the vanguard, but then he thinks he is unfit for the job. Though he's surprised at the job description, Orga still tries to explain the complexity of the job to him and lets him know that he will be the only hope for the soldiers fighting on the battlefront. Once he's done talking, Orga gets up and prepares to take his leave. Ken also gets up and picks Blurin up to continue moving through the town. Before leaving, Orga tells Ken not to hate Rose too much as she's just a little too clumsy with people, but she means well most times. Ken assures him not to worry too much about him as he doesn't have that much of a grudge against Rose. Ken leaves shortly afterward, leaving Orga to his little sister, Ururu, who comes rushing down to check up on him. After running a few more meters, Ken arrives at the castle entrance and is let in by the guard there without any hassle. Upon getting in, he rushes through the crowd while holding Blurin and finds Suzuni training her sword fighting skills with her peers. Suzuni sees him shortly and halts her training to talk to her friend. After getting on a seat with him, Ken introduces her to his blue grizzly bear and talks on and on, only to notice Suzune lost in thought. When she snaps back to reality, she asks Ken to allow her to touch the bear to which he says yes. Suzune tried to touch the bear but the bear ended up slapping her hand away. Then, she tries it again, and the bear bites her hand. Surprised, Ken shows her how it's all done but still ends up getting his hand bitten off. Later on, both friends sit by the fountain to chill out. Ken notices the calluses on Suzune's hands and heals them right away with his healing magic. After it's all healed up, 
Suzune asks Ken if he can come by to see her. Ken breaks her heart by telling her he was there to see just Kazuki. Though disappointed, Suzune tells him that Kazuki is currently out of town on a trip with Siglis to hunt monsters and gather experience. Since it's only for a few days, then there shouldn't be anything to worry about. Ken gets a little worried about Kazuki and lets Suzuni know about it. The friends make more jokes till they laugh their arses out. Later on, Ken continues his journey back to Rose's apartment while thinking about how much he's grown in such a short period. Eventually, he gets back home and settles in before nightfall. By nightfall, Ken finds Rose standing outside and approaches her. Rose asks him if he's gotten used to the training already, and Ken lets her know that he's getting used to it. Before she leaves, Ken tells her about his newfound strength and promises to do everything in his power to save his friends and the others with his healing magic as a member of the rescue team. With this, Rose is very impressed with Ken's mental fortitude and for the first time since she met Ken, she gives him a pat on the back for a job well done. Ken gets to go to bed a happy man, only to get woken up very early the next morning for another job by the king. Ken had to do some training outside the town with Suzune, and he had to be out of bed as quickly as possible so he could get there on time. 